I think we've got, um, okay, we're, we're being recorded. The first of my housekeeping um, was to let people know that uh, this uh, event is being recorded. Um, just in case you think you're in the wrong place, this is our Navigating Intersectionality um, with Una King. It's the uh, EDI event of the Department of Neurogeneration at UCL. And um, I've got a few bits of, of um, housekeeping just to, to mention before we get into the meeting. Um, there is a, a closed caption functionality in Zoom. So um, if you want to activate that, you need to click on the CC button at the bottom of the screen. There is a Q&A function. Please do type your questions. Um, we've, we've had some questions submitted in advance, but I'm sure there'll be many. So we'll try to get to as many as we can during the seminar. And um, in the spirit of us trying to uh, make sure that we're reaching people and um, also understanding what um, your views are, we'd like to start with an anonymous poll of the audience to talk about um, some uh, of the, the themes that we're, we're going to be discussing today. So that and you'll that, that should be um, all clear to you. So the poll should appear. Um, so if that's okay, I would um, like to start by uh, introducing uh, Una. So um, it's great pleasure um, to introduce Una King, and it's lovely to um, see you, Una. So Baroness Una King. Um, uh, is Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at SNAP, and she's previously held a number of incredibly influential diversity roles in about as major organizations as you could possibly imagine, from Google to YouTube and Channel 4. Um, but I first met Una when she wasn't even a Baroness, and um, that was in the run-up to her first her selection and then her election a landslide's uh, victory as an MP for Bethnal Green and Bow in London's uh, East End. And shockingly, when Una won her seat in 1997, she became only the second black woman, I think that's right, Una, isn't it, uh, elected to the UK Parliament, only the 200th woman. Um, but what struck me um, on meeting and, and then getting to know Una was her passion to make the world a better place and and that's uh, including for those who are, are not the most privileged and to tackle inequality and injustice but i was also struck uh, this is the embarrassing bit for una by her enthusiasm her openness and her, her sense of fun too and her ability to relate to people was absolutely uh, obvious so una's also a particularly appropriate a speaker um, for us here because, well, Una's a Londoner and as MP for Bethlehem Green and Bow, she represented one of, if, if not the most diverse, most multicultural communities um, where the layers and layers of lack of privilege uh, are just run so deep. And there's also a great history of um, social reformers. Um, people trying to change things, which hopefully is why we're in this in this meeting today. And I also couldn't imagine anyone better place to speak to us here at UCL. Um, uh, we're uh, uh, you know the London's global university about how we individually make a difference in, in a big organisation. Um, we have a global intake, a global reach, and yet we're set in the heart of one of the most diverse cities. And and Una has experience at working in in some. Of the largest companies with truly global global reach, and um, also her experience of dealing with um, elderly organisations um, in terms of uh, steering and driving the Equalities Act through uh, the UK Parliament in, in 2010. So those are amazing achievements. So hopefully she'll inspire us to make some meaningful changes as individuals and and within this large organisation. So uh, thank you, Una, and it's also my pleasure to introduce my uh, good colleague, Ed Wilde, who is Professor of Neurology in our department, Department of Neurogeneration. Uh, Ed is also a member of UCL's LGBTQ plus steering group and has kindly agreed to facilitate what we hope will be a conversation with Una. Una and Ed, thank you very much again and um, look forward very much to hearing the conversation. Thank you, Nick. 
And uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to my fireside. It's a health and safety uh, approved virtual fireside in my office. Um, Baroness King of Bow, your ladyship, uh, may I call you Una? Uh, you may not call me any of the previous things you called okay. me. Okay. Only call me Una. <laughs> thank you. I'm very, very relieved that you said that It would, because it would have been uh, pretty awkward otherwise. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, the, the, the theme of this evening, uh, at least nominally, is navigating intersectionality. Um, and we, we wanted to just begin really by giving you free reign to, to give us your thoughts on that topic. And um, I, if we run out of time entirely, you'll see me waving. But... Um, well, thank you so much. That's exactly why I'm going to start this stopwatch so that I know how long you have been subjected to a politician's uh, <laughs> speech. Uh, I was about to say at this time in the morning, but it is not this time in the morning for you. Um, I uh, sadly am not in London uh, at the moment. Um, oh, look at that poll result. 48% somewhat confident. That's amazing. Well, of course, you're somewhat confident because you're the sorts of people that Find up to events like this. So um, hopefully we can increase that uh, level of confidence a tiny bit. I would say it's a really good starting point though, that um, it's absolutely fair not to be confident <laughs> in this area uh, for so many reasons. Um, and I find that uh, just as much as someone who in theory has been in this space in one way or another for like over two decades. Um, and certainly when I work with leaders, and when I say leaders, I mean, you know, my, my favorite phrase is you do not need a title to be a leader. Uh, and I found that uh, to be the case, uh, particularly when I went into the House of Lords, I was like, oh my days, <laughs> there are a lot of people around here with a title. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd call them all leaders. So we don't need a title to be a leader, but we do need a plan, right? We need a plan. And too often people just don't know where to start. You know, it's just overwhelming. Um, and I was having a, um, a conversation with my CEO um, at Snap. Uh, he's very young. I mean, I'm 53, so a lot of people seem very young to me, but literally, I think when I met him two years ago, he was 28. Um, and <laughs> I think he's just managed to uh, pass 30 now, but he's, uh, one, of, one of the reasons I went to Snap is because he personally uh, is, very, very deeply committed to DEI. Um, and I think what we've had for a long time is people who are committed in theory and they are committed intellectually. And that is a world apart. I've worked with many of them. I've had them as my bosses many times, really nice people, but DEI isn't their thing. And I just felt I wanted to be somewhere where it was the thing, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, many other uh, reasons beside. I've been wanting to see if we could change the way an industry approaches diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, that's so important from where you're speaking, where, you know, the health of the nation uh, depends on how well you are able to reach and treat and care for diverse groups. So there's, you know, I mean, a lot of industries, there's that direct link and, you know, the tech industry, <laughs> absolutely the same, the most direct link, you know, tech impacts life chances in the 21st century more probably than any other sector than health. And education, I guess, you know, th these are the fundamentals um, of freedom of expression, of opportunity, of access to employment, access to education itself, especially in the pandemic. So, you know, really important that we move the industry. Um, and so I was really thrilled that my CEO, um, his name is Evan Spiegel, he said to me, yeah, see what you can do to drive collective action. And that's one of the big messages I wanted to give you today. And obviously I will get onto the specific topic around uh, intersectionality, but I do think we have to recognize, first of all, why has DEI failed in, in a lot of, <laughs> for a lot of people, a lot of organizations? I count myself among people who have failed at DEI. I was a uh, chief diversity officer for Channel 4 for uh, about eight years, seven or eight years. And um, we did some incredible things and I would say, in the end, I succeeded a few, just about, maybe. But for five years, I actually failed. Um, I failed to shift the workforce numbers. I failed to integrate it for the, for, certainly for the first four years, I failed to integrate DEI into the heart of what my um, executive was doing, uh, you know, C-suite. 
I'm losing the ability to speak in English. It's really deeply depressing to me. I scream at my kids all the time. Don't lose your British accent. Don't lose your... And then I'm like, oh my God, I'm losing my British vocabulary. Anyway, whatever we call C-suite in Britain, <laughs> like um, the executive board, I guess. Uh, um, anyway, so um, I, I had failed there. I mean, Channel 4 is different because it actually has a remit. Uh, a bit the same way, I mean, not the same way, but in a similar way, you know, the health service has a remit <laughs> to uh, treat everyone. Um, Channel 4, even kind of more than that, had a, has a remit to bring um, underrepresented voices to the fore. So I had all the help institutionally you'd think you would need in an organization. Um, and the organization wanted to uh, do great things. And we did do great things. But our workforce numbers, you know, when you're trying to get more women into leadership, when you're trying to get more um, underrepresented racial and ethnic groups uh, into uh, whether it's technical positions, a lot of the same issues um, that we have here, uh, you really need it to be led from the top and it needs to be led from the top with both awareness uh, and passion. Anyway, back to this conversation with my CEO, Evan, who has those two things, right? He said to me, so, you know, what are the, what, what are the three things that everyone uh, at Snapchat, everyone in our company should be doing about DEI? And I hope these will help you all when you're thinking uh, what are the three things? Tragically, I can't give you a to-do list, like do these three things and you will have crossed off systemic racism by lunchtime. That's not going to happen. Um, and so I was really scratching my head. I know, uh, because, and he was right about this. He said, if you can't break it down for people, then the vast majority will not be able to get to it and will not be able to reach it, even though they want to intellectually. So I kind of wrestled with this for a while. And in the end, I thought, okay, you know, what are the three things people need to do in the long term if we're actually going to drive impact around DEI? Because for too long, diversity, equity and inclusion, DEI, or whichever acronym you want to use, people use a ton of different acronyms. The only one I don't like is DIE, because I don't want to say die, die, die. No, this is all about optimism uh, and how we can move DEI from having been very much in a compliance space. It was a tick the box space because we must, as opposed to make sure you have a representative workforce because that is going to drive the most extraordinary results and innovation. So we want to move it from compliance into innovation and essentially talent management. You know, this idea that um, everyone, uh, everyone should be able to do their best work and that shouldn't be governed by, you know, issues such as your gender, your race, uh, you know, your socioeconomic background, uh, your ability, etc. Um, so that was that was the um, starting point of how can we give people uh, these tools? And the first thing, and this comes to the point on intersectionality, the first thing is that most of us don't really know. We haven't actually deeply interrogated personally. Um, where we do and we don't have privilege. So I'll give you an example for myself. Um, yeah, when I did um, go into parliament, um, by the way, only really because Nick decided to send me, but that's another story for another time. That's why I am here at 8 a.m. my time giving a speech. I did always promise to myself I would not do that anymore because I can barely speak at this time in the morning, but too much information. So thanks, Nick. Um, but when I did go into parliament, um, yeah, I was clear. Oh my God, I am so in a minority here. <laughs> like, like I can just see ranks and ranks and ranks everywhere I look all around me of people who do not look like me. I remember, and I'm not even just talking about race, um, I remember being in one uh, health, it was actually a debate on health, and I looked around the chamber, I admit it was quite sparsely populated, you know, half the time in Parliament there isn't actually anyone there, which is a bit sad when you spend a long time preparing your speech, but anyway, I looked around the chamber, I really needed to run to the toilet, and I looked around, and I thought, I was just getting up, and I thought, oh my god, if I leave the chamber, there's no woman sitting here, while, we're, while the British Parliament is debating health. It's like, what? I mean, you know, it's just absurd, absolutely absurd. So, you know, representation uh, it is a huge thing, but, but as an example, intersectionality. So I understood that that's quite obvious in a situation like that, yeah, I get that. What I had never understood, for example, um, I understood I was in a minority group. I never understood 
that I was in a huge majority group and very privileged at that as an able-bodied person, right? Who um, didn't have uh, a disability, um, well, actually later, anyway, another story, Never mind. but didn't have, uh, didn't, didn't need wheelchair access, for example. Then I was asked, um, you know, a disability rights organization got in touch with me as their local MP and said, oh, hey, can we put you in, a, can we put you in a wheelchair for 24 hours um, and just see how you get on? And the only rule is, is that you don't get out of the wheelchair except to uh, use the toilet as long as it's on the same, you know, floor where you are, because people in wheelchairs can't just fly upstairs and through walls and all the rest of it. And I was like, yeah, of course. Yeah, that sounds like fun. I mean, fun wasn't the right word. Um, and obviously the scales fell from my eyes. And I was like, oh, my God, I, I can't even get to the tube station. I can't even get on the tube. <laughs> I can't get to my office. I can't get to my place of work. I can't do anything. <laughs> um, and that made that awareness, which you can get a couple of ways. You can get awareness from um, in, inspiration can be negative or positive. That was sort of negative inspiration. I was like, this is a catastrophe. How can this be, you know, we must do something. But what I was really, the, the key thing here, I was getting awareness, some glimmer of awareness of what the lived experience is. You can never, I mean, obviously I will never know what like, so I have a, uh, you know, someone on my team uh, who reports to me who is a wheelchair user. I will never know what he goes through on an hourly, daily basis. I will never know that. Um, however, I momentarily had a glimpse into the fact that this cannot, this, this cannot go on, <laughs> you know, this cannot go on that I have been so unaware. Um, and I have done so little really to, um, you know, to really champion some of the disability issues. So I did then go on to a uh, chair a disability organization. Um, it's ironic to me now in retrospect, I have four kids that range in age from seven to 16. And I, um, it turns out two of them have disabilities. Uh, and I, you know, at the time, I, I, I know, you know, disability is one of those things that it will come <laughs> if you don't have it in your life now. <laughs> and, and most of us actually do when we think about it in terms of friends, relatives, etc, or ourselves. Um, and then another, I remember at Channel 4 when I was like, right, we've got, to, we've got to get a better handle on how many people with disabilities we have, what type of disabilities are they, is it neurodiversity, is it physical disabilities, is it mental health, what, you know, what are the disabilities, I asked everyone to complete this survey and I kept saying to people, you know, it's really important that people recognize disabilities and ensure that we can count it and that there isn't any stigma attached with it. Really important. If you can do this, please do fill this in, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of it, oh, I mean, we got the results back um, and there were fewer people than we expected because there is a culture of stigma. This was around 2011, I think that I did this. Um, and there still is that, that stigma. Um, but <laughs> a, a little bit after that, I, re I came across something which showed that what I have, um, endometriosis, is actually a recognized disability. And I was like, well, that's really funny. I was the chief diversity officer and I was going around imploring people to recognize <laughs> and to state <laughs> disabilities. And I didn't realize that I also have it. I mean, obviously it's a different type. It kind of, you can't move for one week in four <laughs> sort of thing, but it's a disability. It's quite a serious disability uh, in, at, at those times. I remember once being stretched out of Westminster, uh, you know, when something cripples you and you can't do your job, that is considered a disability. But I was like, oh no, you know, it's, it's bad period pains. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of um, ignorance. It's a lack of awareness. So that's my point. The first thing you need to do is have some awareness of when you are in a majority group and when you are in a minority group. We are all at different times, regardless of who you are, where you're from, we are all at different times in minority and majority groups. Again, speaking to my, <laughs> my CEO, uh, you know, he goes to meetings with tech CEOs and obviously they're all white men. I mean, sadly, they're all white men, um, but he's the only one, you know, under 30. Uh, he, he, there, 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 there is, you will always be in different situations where there is, uh, you know, that, that makes you a minority or majority group and just have that awareness. And then once you have that awareness, you can use it 
to change some of your behavior as I did, like with the disability issue. It, the awareness changed my behavior. So the framework that I came back to my CEO with was what I call uh, the three eyes. So when somebody says, what should I do? There are three eyes to help guide you through the answer to that question. And that first one is what I've just described. It is internal. The first eye is internal actually have a conversation with yourself and decide to make time and space um, for uh, the time it takes to be a good ally. Uh, you know, if we're using the language of allyship, uh, which in the wake of George Floyd's murder um, has become a globally recognized term, I think. Um, and really recognize when you're in a majority group uh, so that you can, even if in a lot of times like me in my work, you might have consistently been a minority group, there are times when you're not, and everyone needs to recognize those times and try and act. So first eye, internal. Um, second eye, interpersonal. So once you have that better understanding, and we're never done. I mean, we're never done. I mean, I could, I'm about to give a speech tomorrow, for example, and my team just came back to me and they were like, oh, you haven't put in indigenous land rights, right? And I, I've got to admit, um, the same way as I used to not, instantly uh, say to people, my name's Una, my pronouns are she, hers. In fact, I think I might have forgotten to say that at the beginning, but <laughs> um, uh, you know, now when people say that in the context of where I am in America, and it's ironic given that, uh, you know, the genetic testing 23andMe, whatever it is, tells me I'm 1% Native American. And I'm like, well, clearly that's not enough because why would I say anything about indigenous like what that I mean what <laughs> and it's all we always have that discomfort the first time you have to do something new whether it's your pronouns the first time my chief financial officer you know a white man in his mid-50s introduced himself saying hi my name's Derek my pronouns are he his I literally had to get on the phone and just send him a message going Derek that is incredible I knew how uncomfortable he was he'd already said to me I just don't get this this is ridiculous why this is ridiculous and I was saying to him well look what you don't understand and what I didn't understand um is that if you're non-binary um and you know if you are in the LGBTQ plus community it shouldn't be up to someone who's not a leader in the room and who who, who often is in a marginalized group to recognize and be able to have that safety around who you are it's something that a straight person never thinks about twice, right? So after having this conversation with the chief financial officer, he was like, okay, yeah, all right, I get it. <laughs> uh, he still really didn't want to do it. And the same way, I really don't want to do this speech tomorrow. And so, because I'm speaking to businessmen, they're going to think I'm mad. If they're going to think I'm like, I've got crystals and I don't know, I don't know what they're going to think, right? And it's that fear it's that fear of doing something that you're just not used to doing, but we just all have to get over that. Um, so the second eye is interpersonal. You then change your behavior when you understand the internal side and you understand you can spot when you can spot your own privilege. You can then spot inequity and you can then start to bring it into the conversation and change some of your behavior, how, what you actually say, what then comes out of your mouth, not just what's in your head and how you behave. And that can be in very specific ways. I mean, you know, we, we have some examples just before a promo process, we will send, you know, when you're thinking of who's gonna get promoted uh, on your team, we will send like literally a 10 minute module saying, you're about to do the promo process. You don't want to be biased. <laughs> hey, look at this, just to remind yourselves, these are the biases that you could fall into. Don't do that in the next six hours when you're doing the promo process. It's little nudges like that to make people who most of the time are well-intentioned and they get it, they understand intellectually <laughs> that a lack of equity is not a good thing. It's not good morally, we know that, but actually it's not good for organizations. It's not whether that organization is the NHS, whether that organization is government, whether that organization is business, it's not good for organizations. So the second point is the second eye interpersonal, change of behavior. The third eye then, when you've done that, you've had the internal conversation to be more aware and knowledgeable around DEI. You've changed some of your behavior as a result of that awareness, the third eye, which I always thought was the most important, but I've um, kind of changed how I think about that a bit now, 
although all of these are very important, the third I is institutional. Change the institution, change the system. What I spent really 20 years doing was always focusing on the third eye. I like saying the third eye and I like the three eye concept because people will know that the third eye is about extraordinary perception and insight, you know, in another framework and structure. So that third eye <laughs> um, of change the institution, change the system, I always place that almost as a policymaker, a politician, I place that, I place that above all else. What I came to realize, and I think what 2020 taught us is that you can change the system, but if you make no attempt to change the way the humans and the people within that system think and behave, then actually the system will never change. And the sentence that sums that up is a sentence like, uh, like one of those management business, whatever, but it, it, it is true. <laughs> and the sentence is culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you may come up and I, I did it for a living. I do it for a living. I come up with the best strategies in the world, <laughs> right? They will be eaten alive and spat out <laughs> if you don't change the culture. And the culture is how people behave. And the way people behave is driven by how people think. So that 3 I framework just helps me and it helps us at SNAP. Um, and I will be posting it next week on my LinkedIn um, account if anybody wants to see it broken down because we then give, I mean, obviously it's for our, our organization, but you can apply it to any organization. We then give examples like, okay, you want to do the first eye internal? Hey, look at some of these podcasts, get some of your news sources from other places. Think about this allyship course that will help you step through this. Um, second eye interpersonal well think about how, you know these are the ways the times the moment the practical examples when in our organization you could change your behavior to take inequity into account um so if you do all those three things and again it's not a to-do list it's not your task list do these three tasks and misogyny will vanish <laughs> but if you do those three things then you will drive the fourth eye which is impact and it's all about impact. So I did just then want to talk about really specifically where intersectionality came from. Um, it was a term coined by a professor in the US uh, called Dr. Kimberly Cranshaw. Um, and what Dr. Cranshaw said essentially was she, she was looking at problems around uh, inequity. Um, she was looking at some court rulings that had come out. And basically there was... Um, a court ruling which was you know the law protected black people in theory um, I you know my father's African-American my family's African-American I always have to put in theory <laughs> um, after that sentence um, it protected women in theory uh, this was a court case where someone was complaining about a manufacturer they were not uh, given employment at this manufacturer um, and they said the manufacturer could say uh, it was a black woman who had brought the legal case against the manufacturer. The manufacturer said, um, but we didn't discriminate against you because we're a because you're a woman, because look, all of our admin staff are women. I mean, let's put aside the extraordinary gender stereotypes that permeate our whole world forever and a day. But still, they were like, look, I should say this is like 30 years, 40. 30 years ago, I think, actually, it's the, the late 80s. Um, they were like, we, we don't discriminate against women because we employ women. Here, here are all the women in our admin um, team. And then they said, and look, we're not discriminating against you because you're black. Because look, all, look at all these black men that we employ on the factory floor. Um, but they would never put a woman on the factory floor and they would never put a black person into admin. Right. It kind of I mean, for me, as a, someone with African-American heritage, it's like it was like they had the house people and they had the out in the field, the cotton, <laughs> they, you know, they, they had those two situations. And what Kimberly, what, what Kimberly Cranshaw did was she said, actually, this person was discriminated against because of the intersection of her identity. She wasn't discriminated against because she was a woman. She wasn't discriminated against because she was a black person. She was discriminated against because she was a black woman. 
And so it's useful just to understand where it comes from uh, as a concept and then use that. So I, you know, fast forward when I was Google's director of diversity strategy for three years, um, we were looking at, uh, you know, what we, we were just looking at how can you get more underrepresented groups. It's really interesting in America, the Asian community is um, very, very overrepresented in the tech workforce. Um, the Asian community makes up over 50% of the tech workforce and about 6% of the population. So very great overrepresentation there. However, hugely underrepresented in terms of leadership, right? ton of stereotyping going on who is a leader who's got executive presence uh, all of that like truly heaped on top of the Asian community when you take an intersectional look at that data it turns out that the single group least likely in Silicon Valley to be promoted uh, to an executive role is Asian women they're less likely than black women obviously a million times less likely than white men. <laughs> um, but, but really, if you didn't have an intersectional approach to that data, you would never uncover that fact. And you'd really just go, oh, the Asian community is really overrepresented. Well, well, there's no place for that community in the work we are doing to drive equity. And that would be absolutely a false conclusion to come to. So intersectionality really is about seeing the bigger picture. I mean, you know, I would liken it, I, I try to persuade companies to get that data and they really don't want to get it. Uh, they don't want to get it for a ton of reasons because basically it can underline problems that can leave them open to legal cases uh, so that, you know, ignorance they think is better. But I'm like, well, you know, it's like if you were going to, if, if you're not healthy, <laughs> do you just want to not have an x-ray or not have a test and not actually have that diagnosis? Like ha ha that doesn't help anything and it certainly doesn't solve anything. Um, so I think the data piece gives us a, a really good example of um, why intersectionality is important. And I'm sure you can all, um, you know, uh, apply that in your own areas. Um, I wanted to mention two more things, maybe one more point and one story, uh, and then open up uh, for questions. But the point is, um, I actually think that the biggest issue we have here, if we want to drive diversity, equity and inclusion, is we need to inspire majority groups to take it up as their issue. We can't just keep having this conversation uh, between groups who are marginalized and leaders who think it's not their job. So leaders have to recognize it is their job and we have to shift the burden of the work because at the moment, who does the overtime on DEI? It is the women, it is the LGBTQ plus community, it is the people with disabilities, <laughs> it is the people from, uh, you know, socioeconomic groups that, you know, didn't ever have that investment in them. They know what it's like to try and get into essentially a closed system. Incidentally, when I did introduce um, socioeconomic status as something that we would measure uh, at Channel 4, uh, I'm so proud of Channel 4. We're the first company, as far as I'm aware, certainly the first broadcaster to ever do that. Um, and you could, you would know why when we got the results, because it turned out, I think, you know, 92% of the company was not from uh, a low socioeconomic group, which just underlines the level of privilege that's there all the time, whether we measure it, whether we acknowledge it or not, right, all the time. Um, so how do we inspire majority groups? Um, I, at the moment, I'm working on a big thing that's going to be uh, a big report that's going to be released uh, next uh, Thursday actually um, and that report well what I did was I convened um, a group of like 30 academic and think tank experts who also are at the intersection of business because the problem with business is and I know the NHS is a special and beloved case although a lot of the things that come out in this report will be absolutely relevant to you or anyone who's interested in the practical actions you can take to drive for DI. But anyway, got this expert group together and we were specifically looking at the tech industry though, like I say, most, I would say 95% of the recommendations are applicable to any uh, organization or business. Um, and the question I set them was, what would it take? What would it take to transform DEI outcomes in the tech industry. Um, and that expert group met, we met, we met 
every fortnight for one year to answer the question. They were very, very clever people. And it still <laughs> was a very, very hard question to answer. Um, but we've crunched down that year of meetings into 10 actions, four recommendations, which ladder to 10 actions that any group, you know, at least nine out of 10 of those, any company uh, could take maybe one of them, which is you need to change the education system. <laughs> uh, maybe that's something that, you know, larger companies and organizations need to look at. But certainly the NHS would um, be able to have a point of view on that, on how we get, uh, you know, further downstream to change who gets the opportunity to come and get those jobs in medicine uh, across the piece and in the health service. Um, anyway, so that report is really looking at what can what can people do, whether they are in majority groups or minority groups, but also let's recognize that we fail if we just have this conversation between minority groups and without the presence of leaders. And the one key takeaway from it, I think more than any other, is that you must integrate your DEI plan into your core organization strategy so for companies that's their business plan I don't know what you call your you know your forward plan in the NHS I know I remember you obviously any organization certainly one as large and influential and important as the NHS you have that plan you have that plan for 2022 and you'll also you also have I've seen it a couple of times in the past you have a DEI plan and strategy my question is is everything in that DEI strategy is it already in the business plan? Is it woven into it with the metrics um, and the consequences that happen to the really important <laughs> measures in the business plan? Because if it's not integrated into the business plan, essentially it will not happen and it will not work. Um, and that's what I mean about, you know, about majority groups. If the, the people who are the gatekeepers, the decision makers, those are the ones who need to be inspired. Um, I want so I want to then tell one story. I also need to have the sip of coffee because you know I mean I did incidentally lock my four kids out of this room. I think it's probably like Lord of the Flies out there. I'm hoping you can't hear <laughs> some of the noise, but I've left them to try and get themselves dressed, fed, and to school today, um, so that I could tell you this story uh, from my time at Channel Four. Um, and basically, the head of Film Four wonderful woman, white woman, uh, she said, hey, we're film four and we've never invested in a black person as a director, like ever, like, wow, that's quite bad. <laughs> um, so she says, to her, she says to her team, go and find me um, a black person that we can invest in as a film director. And her team, you know, they're looking everywhere, the, you know, they, <laughs> you've heard that clarion cry before, find me find me a diverse person, <laughs> find me some, uh, you know, some talent that's not from the usual talent pool that we've drawn. Anyway, they come back to us six months later and they're like, sorry, we've looked everywhere. And in terms of someone who is the caliber of what Channel 4 would invest in, we can't find anyone. And her response was really interesting. She said to them, well, in that case, either you are looking in the wrong place or we are asking for the wrong qualifications because it isn't possible that you can say to me, there's no black person in Britain that we could invest in, you know, as a director, that, that clearly is not the right answer, right? So if that's not the right answer, what are you gonna change about the rest of the equation? So go away and try again. <laughs> so they came back not six months later. So by now a year has gone past and they're like, no, sorry, just, they're just not there. So she didn't take this for an answer. Instead, she said, OK, we're going to scrap those qualifications that we usually asked for. We're going to look, in fact, in, a diff in an adjacent talent pool. And the adjacent talent pool, and in this story, I hope there are things that anyone in any business and any sector and the health service as well, especially you have been doing this in COVID, looking in adjacent talent pools <laughs> to be able to meet the need that you have. Um, she said, OK, we're going to look for we're going to look at someone. Here's a visual artist. They've done really well. Let's see if we can essentially nurture them, have a long-term relationship with them. Um, and so they put in place a deal where they did, uh, it was uh, three films over five years. And the third film won the Oscar for best film. Steve McQueen 
when he won the Oscar for 12 Years a Slave, do you think anyone was going, oh, he came off a diversity scheme, didn't he? <laughs> oh, look, you see, there you go. Black people lowering the bar. <laughs> Steve McQueen didn't lower the bar. He, without a shadow of a doubt, is considered one of the world's top directing talents. But his talent couldn't get through previously. The only reason his talent got through is because a leader said, no, we are going to prioritize diversity. We are going to prioritize it. We're going to extend how long we recruit for, because that's the other thing. Diversity always gets shut down uh, in the process. By the way, I think my computer might be about shut down if I don't plug in the charger, which is just here. If you see me duck away, I'm not, I'm not leaving. <laughs> just don't want to get cut off. Um, so, you know, it really was about prioritizing diversity. And when <clears throat> excuse me, when all of her team around her, well, not all of her team, many on her team were essentially either muttering or thinking in their head. And I can understand why you arrive at this conclusion. Oh, scrapping qualifications. So what? So we're going to do that for a black person. Well, that's not fair on a white person, is it? Like, I understand how you get there. But we have to understand <laughs> that the current system systemically locks groups out. And, you know, it was the same uh, in Parliament with the introduction of all women shortlists. Um, you know, you have to, I, I remember in Parliament, I mean, I didn't get the abuse. Um, Nick helped me become an MP. Uh, it wasn't on an all women shortlist, but my co-work, my, my colleagues, you know, MPs in Parliament got so much abuse. These men would stand up and go, you're only here because you're a woman, all women shortlist, disgusting. And you'd literally be going, oh, wait a minute. What about the last 500 years? If you ever noticed it was an all male shortlist, hello. <laughs> and you know, at a certain point, you've got to take the choice. You've got to make a decision. Do you want to do something or are you going to let the status quo continue? So that was my story thrown in a framework that hopefully might help uh, the three eyes. And I want us to remember that it is about inspiring majority groups. And I think that can also help us think about the way we approach this. If you're going to approach DEI essentially by saying you're the problem, you know, essentially <laughs> shorthand, white people, you're the problem, <laughs> or men, you're the problem. Um, you're not going to engage those people that, you know, if someone said to me, hey, mixed race, black, Jewish woman, you're the problem. I wouldn't really want to sit down to have that conversation. <laughs> right. So we, we're at the point where we have to have people engaging, engaging, putting a gun to their head doesn't really well, we know it doesn't work. It doesn't result in what we want. So I really think we have to be imaginative about how we do that. There are so many routes into that. I mean, when, when you're talking about dads and fathers, that's a key point where an organization can engage uh, men who usually 99% of the time think they're in a major majority group and that DEI has nothing for them. It's not true. Um, and so I hope some of these ideas uh, will help. I know you've got the toughest job on earth um and you know as a british person who just the nhs is a beloved institution especially when i live in america and i live in a place where i see adults who in their entire adult life they've never seen a doctor you know that and i see that lack of i see what that does in fact forget well i don't mean forget those people that i see all the time but closer to home my beloved cousin um she is, uh, sorry, she was um, five years younger than me. And she was really, uh, she could tell there was something, she was really ill. She worked, um, she had dropped out of uh, university and she worked for Clinique. She worked for a beauty company, like in a concession. Ordinary person, ordinary job, beautiful, extraordinary human being, one of the favorite people in my life. Um, and she didn't have health insurance. So, but she knew there was something wrong. So she was so clever. She decided, okay, I'm going to change my job. I'm going to get a job with a health insurance company because that is the only way in America I can guarantee I will see the doctor that I need to see. She did that. She got to see the doctor and the doctor said, you've got colon cancer stage four and she died. And her, you know, 15 year old child has been left alone. And that is what you, that is what happens in a country where you don't have the NHS. So love what you do and would love to answer your questions. And I am just going to plug my computer back in if that's OK. Thank you, Una. Goodness me. Please do plug your computer. We'd, we'd much rather not be able to see you for a few seconds than lose you all together. Um, what a tour de force. Um, you know, we, we had many questions before uh, the, the session. And I have to say, 
through everything you've just said, you've answered the vast majority of the questions. Most of the questions we had were, what can I do um, to, um, to, to help other people who are underrepresented? Um, and um, uh, what can we do as an institution? Um, you know, and for me, there's a lot of resonance in what you said about um, well, what I call heavy lifting, the idea that underrepresented groups have to do all of the heavy lifting, end up doing all of the heavy lifting themselves. So I guess for me, the question is, you know, we've got the, the, the you've sort of given us homework, you know, we've got the, the internal, we've got the interpersonal. How do we, if the institution's not listening, how do we push through that wall as the people who do want to do want to help? How do we make that happen? Yeah, that I mean, and that is the question. And you know, fundamentally, that's why I moved to Snapchat <laughs> because I was like, <laughs> that's so exhausting. I've done that for so many years, and I just want to know what it's like just once to have the top person. I was going to say the top guy because it is usually the top guy, and maybe not in the NHS, hopefully, but <laughs> to have the top guy <laughs> say, "Oh, Una, yes, that's my priority." let's do that <laughs> right so I know just how exhausting it is and I know as I was saying at the outset <clears throat> those people are usually well-intentioned um I think it's a combination of things I do think you need to get the data uh, mm. you mustn't be paralyzed by not having the data right and you mustn't do the other thing which happens with data is that as soon as you get a bit of data people are like oh well I can't do anything until I get more data <laughs> yeah. you know it's what you one of two ways it's either you haven't got any data so don't do anything or you've got some data and therefore you must spend another three years collecting more data you know you don't need a phd to understand for example in my world that there aren't enough women in our tech organization you you don't you don't need you don't need to be a data scientist to work that out what you do need the data on is for example some of the intersectional stuff you'll never work mm. that out intuitively what you should be looking at are things like i i, I mean look i can tell you what you should be looking at but I think you're asking the question before that, how, how do we get the leaders to decide they want to look at that? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, you know, it comes down to, uh, it comes down to whether you value talent uh, in your organization yeah. and, and hopefully your leaders do. Um, that's actually why I've spent the last two years of my life writing this report. Uh, well, it wasn't two years, it was about a year and a half, but I spent six months before that trying to persuade all these experts to get, in one room and to commit a year of time to do it precisely because there wasn't really a, <clears throat> a manual that you could just wave at a leader and a CEO or the, the top person and say, hey, this report of 30 of the world's foremost experts on DEI says that if you want your organization to be successful, you should do these 10 things please give us an answer. Which of these 10 are you happy to do today? Which do you want to do next year? We can be reasonable, but let's have the plan. Like I said, don't need a title <laughs> to be a leader in DEI, but you need a plan, right? So I hope, I mean, that's basically my contribution is to all the people in all the organizations, because I've been in that position so many times where either you're the only one or you're not the only one, but leadership just doesn't see you, just doesn't understand how difficult it is on a day-to-day -day basis when you have those, Nick mentioned the layers of exclusion essentially and the layers yeah. of poverty. And that's why intersectionality is such an important lens um, <clears throat> to use as well. But just to say, hey, look, this is what, this is what the experts say. Are you really gonna ignore what the experts are saying here? And now, yes, it is overwhelming, so we're not saying you have to do these 10 actions by Wednesday week, right? But you need to put that plan in place. And one of the key recommendations in this report is that you must ensure your DEI plan is fully integrated into the organization's business plan. Can we just tick that off? Let's see who's doing it. Who's responsible for it? Who are the leaders that are responsible for the actual? I mean, you have to break it down. And if your DEI plan, I mean, I know the NHS DEI plan, <laughs> I can't remember what you call it, forgive me, but I have read it once. <laughs> and I do it is, I do know it is very specific. I mean, of course it is, it is, it is very specific. What I have no idea of, and, and maybe you'll be able to think about, and then the same goes obviously for your own organization where you actually are, um, you know, is it, is it meaningfully built into the business plan? And that means, does it have the same, um, 
sanctions essentially and rewards. I mean, it's a classic one with DEI. Like everything else is built into, for example, with the executive team, literally their pay in the private sector depends on whether they hit all of these things in the business plan. They can miss the DEI plan, nothing happens. No reward, no disincentive either. So now that we have, for example, at SNAP transferred over to the business plan, they actually, they, they monetarily <laughs> lose out. Like there is a significant, mm. and it shouldn't just be, it can't just be about the money. My whole point is that it's about the way people think. Mm. And it, it can't just be about money, but it has to be about specific incentives and rewards. Right, because if there are no incentives for not changing things, then clearly yeah. things will either not change at all or get worse or take way too long right. to improve. Here's yeah. one Here's one really kind of, it's a probing question that came through. How can we ensure if if we manage to in, uh, improve recruitment of people from underrepresented groups, how can we be sure that we're not just dumping them into a hostile environment, which is more or less what happened to you in 97? Um, yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, the way I ask people to think about um, this issue is that representation, you know, you want to have good representation. Uh, what does that mean? Usually we're talking about at least reflecting the society, the community around you. You want to have that representation. Um, well, in having that representation, you've got to remember that it's an equation and your representation is, is a result of these other things. And these other things, which are what you should be measuring and intersectionally measuring are your hiring. So it's your hiring rate plus your promo rate, i.e. who is being valued in the organization, who is being promoted, minus your attrition, mm. who are you losing? And it is that equation, hiring plus promo minus attrition, that equals representation. When people say, oh, we haven't got enough women, or we haven't got enough black people, or we haven't got enough whatever it is you want to insert in the box, they look at their hiring strategy and they forget that it's like a three-legged mm. stool. It will fall over if you don't have an inclusive culture for those groups to go into. So again, um, this report that's being published next Thursday, um, it's called the ACT Report, um, Action to Catalyze Tech. Like I say, it, the, the principles there are applicable to any group or organization that wants to take it forward. And that goes into quite some detail of what you can do, yes, around the hiring, but around inclusive culture. Um, and, I, and again, I do think, you know, psychological safety is a huge issue. It's been proven to be a huge issue, um, but there are lots of little things you can do that make a culture inclusive in very specific terms. My favorite one, and there are a ton of things listed in this report, literally it's like over 150 pages, but don't worry, it's got a one and a half page summary. Uh, but my, my favorite one is actually about, um, task assignment and what that really means is who gets to do those interesting projects that are the ones that lead to visibility in an mm. organization promotion and there's actually a research organization in america that has created it's called um nc wit it's the national council for women in technology and they've actually created a tool to enable managers to actually just track you know, and to help them think about, because you are going to give it to the person, either it's recency bias, oh, who did I just work with who, yeah, they were reliable for me, yep, I'll do them. Uh, you know, it's those little things that get layered upon each other that result in some people just never getting that chance, yeah. essentially the visibility that leads to promo and they get buried, they get buried in an organization, happens all the time. Um, anyway, there are, the, yeah, I don't want to say to every question, read the act report but there will be a lot more detail there um but i think that you know psychological safety ensuring that the leadership is brought in it comes back to the leadership and it comes back to culture will eat strategy for breakfast you might have a great strategy to get more hires in mm -hmm. if your culture is going to spit them out you are dead in the water so you've got to address culture key point great question thank you so much we are running out of time. And um, uh, the, the, the only other question I can just reflect to you is uh, not a question, just wow. That was what was typed into the, into the Q&A during the session. I think that's very much how I feel right now. Uh, I, we should all read the ACT report. You've also given us a lot to think about and, and really tangible actions to, uh, to carry out and to um, 
uh, echo into our into our working and everyday lives. So thank you so much for taking the time. I'm now going to hand over to Alain uh, Plunfavre, Professor Alain Plunfavre, who's a professor uh, in the Department of Neurodegenerative Disease and also the Deputy Director of the Institute of Neurology for uh, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. So um, thank you so much and over to you, Alain. Thank you, Ed. Really, and good evening, everyone. So really, before I say a few words, I have been asked to remind everyone to please send your feedback uh, in the post-event uh, poll, if that's possible. But first, of course, I would really like to, uh, to thank you, Una. I mean, we couldn't have wished for a more inspiring, more engaging, and more thought-provoking, I think, discussion for the launch uh, of our um, Institute of Neurology EDI Talk series. So thank you so much. I think it's really been a privilege to learn from all uh, your experiences. And uh, the three eyes that you were mentioning actually particularly resonated uh, with me. And as you said, I really think that we want UCL to be a place where idea is not a thing, but is really the thing. So we will take your lessons on board and we will make our best to keep really making institu institutional changes at UCL. So um, I agree with you that we really have quite challenges ahead of us, I think, for EDI, but I also think that many of these challenges are, in my opinion, quite opportunities, I think, for us to promote a culture of care in our work, but also, also in our personal environment. So I'd like to use this opportunity to uh, tell everyone on the call that if you would like to make a difference, if you would like to contribute to equality, diversity, and inclusion in any way, please feel free to get in touch with Anna or with myself or with any of uh, our EDI committees uh, at ION, but also at faculty, of course, uh, and in the university. So I just wanted to uh, finish in the last two minutes, maybe, to, um, by giving you just a few examples of uh, initiatives that we are currently running at the Institute of Neurology. And I have to say that much has changed uh, in, the, in, the, in the DDI landscape uh, in the last uh, 10 to 12 months. And in particular, thanks to uh, the appointment of Anna, who is here on the call today, Anna de Suzanne, who is our I1 uh, EDA um, project manager and who is absolutely fabulous. So you were talking about data, uh, um, Una, and actually uh, uh, what we're doing, one of the new things we're doing is that we are now collecting and analyzing staff and student data on an annual basis. And exactly like you were saying, we have an intersectionality lens on. So not only for gender and ethnicity, but also for disability, religion and belief, sexuality, etc. And of course, this data will inform uh, our action plan and uh, our policies. In 2021, we have also implemented the ION James Samuel Recent Russell Studentship, uh, a scholarship program to support students from underrepresented backgrounds. And uh, we have actually given this studentship to uh, two students uh, this year. And finally, uh, we are also endorsing the Into Research program, uh, which aim is really to uh, support students from disadvantaged backgrounds getting access uh, uh, to um, PhD placement offerings. So to, that, to this end, really what we're doing is offering them training, uh, support, mentoring uh, from academics, and also uh, an access to a funded summer research placement in a top university. So the pro this program was really originally developed by uh, Cassie Huggin and her team at uh, the IUN Welcome Center for Human Neuroimaging. And now it has been expanded to UCL and beyond. So I look at the time and I really don't I can't talk uh, much longer. My last word would be also like uh, uh, Ed would be wow. And I've seen many wows in the chat. Uh, Una, this is really so, uh, so impressive, impressive and inspiring. But I would really like uh, to finish by thanking Nick Dexter, Kia, all the EDI committee for the IOM Department of Neurodegenerative Disease. Of course, I'd like to thank Ed for being, as always, a wonderful host. And all of you, and I have to say it's great to see, I mean, uh, over 170 people uh, on uh, the call today uh, for listening and for asking uh, uh, questions. Last but not least, I want to thank Anna for all her help with the organization and the event. And we really are hoping to hold uh, an IOM EDI talk series every three to four months uh, every year. And so I'm hoping to see you all again uh, at our next event, probably um, early 2022. I have to say that succeeding to you, Una, won't be an easy task for our next speaker. 
but really we really look forward to it and again uh, I just want to thank you Una and uh, thank uh, everyone and I'm just going to hand over to Anna who has to say one last few words I think. Uh, yes thank you Elaine it's just to remind everyone that we will follow up with an email uh, to the, with a link to the recorded uh, talk that Ona gave today and I want to thank Ona again for her time it was fabulous. Thanks so much, Anna. Thank you, everyone. It's great speaking to you. Good luck with everything. We need you. We need your leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Una. Thank you. Thanks, Una. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.